when the, the people were drafting the, the, the Declaration of Human Rights, in fact, someone sent the first draft to uh, Gandhi, Mahatma Gandhi. And he responded to this in a very interesting way. He took time first and he sent a letter by saying, I'm sorry about the delay in my response, but my mother taught me that with every single right, there is a duty. And this is it, this is the point. The point from an Islamic viewpoint is this obsession about your rights is making you forget that in fact you are the vicegerent in, on earth and you have duties. And if you want to start with your rights, never forget that as human beings you need to get the duties first. And this is why in the book I, I, wrote, I, I wrote on Muslims in secular societies, I started by responsibilities and rights. But responsibility is the way, you know, it's not, it's not nothing what I'm saying. It's very important, it's a philosophy of life. When you look at yourself, are you as citizens claiming your rights or do you understand that you have commitments and obligations towards the society? And as Muslims, the philosophy of our rights is based on our philosophy of our dignity as active human beings respecting their duties, their obligations. And this is why we understand two things, that khulafa fil art, you, you are not the owner, you are the vicegerent on earth, and second, litakunu shuhada ala nas, you bear witness to your message before people. You have the obligation to be witnesses. And by the way, you know what? When I meet a Christian, when I meet a Buddhist, when I meet a Hinduist, when I meet uh, even a secular, the only thing that I'm asking her or him is please, instead of talking too much, be the witness of your principles in your life. Just show me who you are. Not the way you speak, but the way you behave. And this is the philosophy of life. This is the philosophy of life. This is the way you can deal with human rights, by saying that's all good, but you start with yourself, you start with your duties. Because all this celebration of human rights, when you see the power, they are using the human rights, and they don't take from the human rights the constraints that are coming onto them. Very often, you know, we use... Today, human rights declaration is used against societies that are poor and that are uh, in difficulties, but not against the powerful. What about the human rights and your duty? How come do you teach the people the human dignity and you treat people the way you are treating them in Guantanamo? How come you do that? How come, in fact, in your own philosophy of human rights today, when an Arab is killed is less important than when an American is killed? You have set this psychology that is unacceptable. It depends who is killed. The no. And I'm saying an Arab, I could say a Malaysian. Huh? As well. So I, I think that we are at the same level of value. The Arabs a bit better. <laughs> no, joking. This is my take on it. <laughs> no, I'm joking. But it's not a joke. It's unacceptable. It's really unacceptable. So having behind a philosophy of human rights that is accepting this because we only speak about our rights and not understand our duties towards humanity and the first duty towards humanity is really to be serious about the fact that we are equal. Ya ayyuha nas inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa untha O you people, we created you from a male and a female. You are all equal. No differences. We have to be serious about the duty of this humanity. It's a duty to come with this. It's not only to speak about my rights. Then we come and we struggle for our rights. But in the very, very clear uh, uh, disposition that we have about our duties. So this is the problem I have with this philosophy of human rights today. It's just we are forgetting, even with citizens. The citizens are taking into the streets, asking for their rights, and say, what, what are you doing for the society? In which way you are contributing? In which way you, 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 you are even going, you know, for the elections? Some have the, 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 the opportunity to go and to vote. They don't go because they don't take it seriously. Only when it's fun for the president. But when it comes at the local level where things should matter, they are not there. 20%, 25% of the people are voting, meaning they don't care. They don't have a sense of commitment towards the society. So this is a deep crisis. This is where we need to come with a, a philosophy in Islam 
This is where the Muslims, but also with others coming from other philosophical and religious traditions, we should contribute in this discussion. Not only by being on the defensive. You know what? We like human rights. We are Democrats. Welcome. And so what? And so what? What are we going to contribute uh, to in the whole discussion? Now, my conclusion with all this in two minutes is really to come to this understanding that from an Islamic viewpoint, we don't have a problem, but we need to come with a vision for the future. And what we have in the Arab world today is new leaders, for example, they are saying, we are okay with democracy. This is what uh, Morsi is saying. This is what uh, Nahda and the people in Nahda are saying. We don't have a problem with democracy. We don't have a problem with human rights. Now, what we want is not this discourse only being on the defensive by saying we are Democrats. For example, uh, the Turkish uh, uh, prime minister, when he was asked about because there is also another discussion. I, I gave a lecture on this in, uh, in uh, KL uh, two days ago. All this discussion about Islamists and post-Islamists and the, uh, the question about Erdogan, are you still an Islamist? And his answer being, I'm a Muslim Democrat, <laughs> which is good. Uh, but in fact, he was responding to the, the, them in the way he was dealing with the Christian Democrats by saying, I, I am exactly the same. I have an Islamic background, you have a Christian background, an Islamic ethics, you have a uh, Christian ethic, and then I'm a Democrat. It's not contradictory. So that's it. This is where I am. In the, so this is a way, but now with this, what is going to be the true implementation of the democratic process within our society's understanding that we need to deal with all the, 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 the economic discussions that I was talking about in the beginning. This is where it's good to have all this in mind, but to understand now that there are critical discussions to have in our societies. The first one is within. Which kind of education are you going to promote? There is no democracy without education. When you go and you spread democracy and the people are ignorant, ignorance and democratic rights and duties are not matching. It's not possible. You need to deal with an educational policy. And this is where you see in the Muslim majority countries, even in your country, we should do much more in educating not only uh, efficient workers, but dignified citizens, which is not the same, which is not the same. You can be the best in uh, mastering and managing the know-how and not by being a dignified citizen, understanding your duties towards the community and the society. So this is education, it's important. The, uh, the cultural side of everything to celebrate and something which has to be done also in your country to celebrate the cultural dimension and the cultural resistance as something which is empowerment. And by the way, if we want to be serious about women involved in politics, involved in the job market, this has to do with education. Don't ask the women the way they dress. Ask them how much they are educated and getting opportunity in the job market. You really like to clap, huh? So, <laughs> so this, is, this is something which is important and we have to push on this. And there are challenges, there are challenges for any Muslim majority countries when it comes to very specific rights that are connected to human rights but are also connected to uh, the Muslim dignity about freedom of speech. How much are we allocating people to speak? How much can they speak in a society and not in the name of uh, being the guardian of religion? Because some states are the guardians of the religion when it suits them. So they are playing with Islam. They are playing with religion. You can't say this because it's against Islam. But what you are doing, all the corruption from the hand the scene, is it for Islam? <laughs> so you use Islam whenever it suits you. That's also something which is important, freedom of expression. Do we leave the people, let the people speak their mind? And this is something which is in our educational process, in our educational system, something which is important. Give the floor to people to be able to speak. So freedom of expression, it's important. And the next challenge for us, if we want to be serious about implementing democracy, is to change the way we deal with economy. And in the region here, in South Asian, uh, with South Asian countries, we really have to understand that what is happening in the Middle East has to do with the shift towards the east of the center of gravity of the economic order today. That China, India, Russia, uh, Turkey, uh, South American countries, Brazil, you know, BRIC, what we call BRIC, and also South African countries, and now Indonesia, 
and Malaysia, you are going to play a very important role in the coming future. It's no longer, you know, East, the West and Islam. It's something new that is happening now. And the Muslim majority countries and Middle Eastern countries should be very, be, very much be serious about the multipolar world in economic terms, if they are serious about democracy and serious about the new economic stability that is needed to get democracies in our society, in the Muslim majority countries and in all the societies that we are talking about. Sorry for having too long. Thank you. Thank you. Will Professor Ramanan please remain on stage? Um, yeah, please remain on stage um, to receive a small token of thanks. I would like to invite YB Dato Manso, Professor Wu, and Mr. Zairel Kir Johari, CEO of Penang Institute, up on stage to present Professor Ramadan with a beautifully carved wooden veneer picture of the Jubilee Clock Tower of Penang. Please.